dear God. Today we pray for America. A nation in desperate need of Jesus. Remind us that true freedom is found in the arms of our Savior. Lead us back to our first love. That we may be one nation under God. time. Good morning, church. We are so glad that you guys have decided to join us today. Uh, welcome to our Facebook family that are just now tuning in, and we are glad that uh, everyone is here uh, for a new series that we are starting uh, here in the month of October. Uh, I've been you know, feeling like this is supposed to be something I was going to share on in October for a little over a year, and you know, it was funny because as I was uh, sharing this with my wife and just kind of kind of some of my thoughts around this. She's like, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> like, you know, you know are, aren't you afraid we're going to get picketers? Aren't you afraid? That, and I'm like, I, I, tr I trust that God has put this on my heart and I'm going to do this in a way that I feel best honors God and also honors what we're going through as a country. And so um, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a time where I was told when you go to dinner parties, when you're meeting new people, there's two things you do not discuss. You do not discuss religion and you do not discuss politics. And if that's the way you grew up, this is going to be a very uncomfortable month for you. <laughs> because all month long, we're going to be kind of trying to figure out where is that intersection? Where is the intersection of politics and religion, because I believe it's there. I believe this is something that we are supposed to be discussing and engaging with. I find it interesting, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, knowing that this was a series that was going to, you know, be coming up, I was sitting and I was at Raw Deal having coffee with Francis, and all of a sudden, uh, this gentleman just walks up to us. You know, didn't know who he was, Never seen him before. I kind of saw him over in a corner, and it sounded like, you know, they were having some political discussion over there. And I was like, okay. But all of a sudden, he felt obligated to come and engage us. And so um, he's like, I just want to let you know, I, I just so appreciate seeing two Americans from diverse backgrounds sitting and having a conversation together. I didn't have the heart to tell him he was not from America, but that's okay. I, I let him go on with his rant, um, and he's like, okay, can I just ask you a question? What do you think is the most important issue facing our country right now? I said, that's simple. I think the most important issue facing our nation right now is the fact that there is a God in heaven who loves all Americans, and he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for them. And most people don't even recognize that is an offer waiting for them. And he looked at me, he's like, oh, okay, how about you? And I was like, <laughs> okay, I know where this guy stands, you know. And so um, I, I won't go into the rest of the conversation, but it was just, it was just interesting. Like, he, he felt it was his job to try to school us on what things we should be caring about in our country. And, and again, talking to a, a young man from Malawi who... I mean, I'm sure he cares about what's going on in our country, but it was, just, it was just interesting to see that take place. Well, you know, we, we're going to continue that vein here and just try to figure out what, what exactly are our positions. What should we care about? How should we move forward as Christians in a world that seems so divided? You know, it's funny, I got this... Uh, this sign up here, I almost put up the one I took a few years ago um, in, I think it's in Wausau, there's a sign very similar to this. It's the Union 
uh, it's, the, it's the intersection of unity and division. You know, I was just like, that, that's kind of, <laughs> we're kind of fighting that battle too, aren't we? You know, and so, um, but biggest thing is, I want you to kind of stay involved with what we're going through this. You know, don't check out. I know this would be an easy thing for people to say, well, I, they're talking politics at church. Church gets too political. Trust me, we're, we're going to keep it in a vein where I feel like everyone can walk away and feel like God is speaking to us. And so if you want to stay connected, make sure you've go, gone ahead and uh, filled out your Connect card. Uh, we're going to make sure that you know about the upcoming things that we're going to be talking about and that you can stay connected with how we're going to be framing this during the month of October. And so if you're online and you're just joining us now, you can text the word RIVER to 715-953-4060 and you'll get a digital version of the Connect card. And if you're here and, and you did not fill this out, you can still turn it in at our Welcome Center or the Coffee Center and we'll make sure you stay connected. Well, today in part one of this series, I want to talk about how it's time to build your home. That if we're going to be serious about politics, that we have to be serious about what's going on in our own household. Sometimes politics can be as simple as simply taking care of our own houses. And so I want to, I want to talk about that in light of a story I read recently as I was going through my Bible. It, it's the story of the exile when the king of Babylon had come and laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. And there was a man living in Jerusalem at that time by the name of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet and he recognized that the political winds were changing. He saw a new political regime beginning to take and exert its force over the people of Israel. And it was frightening. It was frightening to Jeremiah. It was frightening to a lot of the people in that time. They were realizing that when this new regime came in, that they were going to do things to their people that they were not happy with. They were going to sterilize the children. They were going to take away women's right to choose what happens to their own body. They were going to come in and exert their own political agendas on those people. And Jeremiah was left with a people group going, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to respond to this? I, I know it may not feel like it relates to our time, but hopefully as we jump back you know, 2,500 years, we'll see these same things keep playing themselves out. We, we keep experiencing these same issues. And so Jeremiah, the prophet of God, got a word. And this was the encouragement. This is the word that he gave to the people as they were preparing for a new government to take control of their people. And so I want us to stand for the reading of God's word. I'm going to be reading in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 5 through 11. Jeremiah 29, verses 5 through 11. And this is how it reads out of the New Living Translation. And again, these are the words of God to the people of Israel. God says, build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the fruit they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that they may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I send you in exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. This is what the Lord of heaven's army, the God of Israel says. Do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I'll bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good 
and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for your good plans. I pray this morning as we look into your word that you would begin to show us how we are to live in a divided country. How we are to live in a nation that proclaims that they are under God but oftentimes feels like they don't honor you at all. I pray that through this series, we would have a greater appreciation of who you are and what you've called to do us to do in this great country. As we pray these things in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, before you see it, why don't you turn to a person or two and just welcome them. Let them know how excited you are to be at church with them. If you're joining us online, please uh, share who you are and where you're worshiping at. And then you guys can find your seats. So, all right. So as we're looking at this, there's a couple of things that I want to kind of point out. You know, when, when we talk about politics, it, it's easy to think that those politics and religion are supposed to be completely separated, that they're supposed to be something that we, we never let touch. And the truth is, when you look at the Bible, when you look at what, the way God designed it, there was supposed to be a focus on God in the way we navigate the world. We talked about this a little bit last week as we have been spending time in our Bible engagement uh, studies, looking at the creation of the world, looking at how things have been put together. And so we, we, we have this as a backdrop. And so I want to I wanna read a passage of scripture that we just kind of touched on last week, but I said we'd be coming back to it this week. And it's Genesis 1, 28. And this is God creating a narrative for the first human beings and really for all of us. It says, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Now, as I was preparing for this message, somebody completely detached from our church sent me an email that was kind of attacking Christian nationalism and attacking this idea of whether Christians should be involved in politics. And they actually pointed to this verse and people who lift it up and they call them dominionists. That, that there's this group of people in our country, they're dominionists. They're saying, you know, we're supposed to have dominion over these things. And that's actually what it says. But I hope as you look at it, you realize it's not about us exerting our dominion over the world as much as it is God inviting us to mirror him in creation. You know, as we talked a little bit about last week, God looked down on the earth and it was chaotic and formless. And then he began to speak into the world. He began to speak in such a way where Mountains and stars and galaxies and animals came to life. He took this chaotic nothingness and began to give it form and structure. And then he looked at humanity, which he created in his image, and he said, the same things that I have done, you're called to do. You're called to go out into the world and take the untamed chaos I've left out there, and I want you to create order out of it. I want you to create systems that provide for the flourishing of humanity as well as nature, as well as the world around you. Like he, he, he gave them this edict to go out and figure out what it means to flourish as people created in the image of God. And that's a great idea. There's just one issue, man's problem. That it didn't take us very long, at least we don't really know how long it took us, but at some point, humanity rebelled against this concept. 
Humanity decided they wanted to define for themselves what was good and what was evil. And so they completely messed up the system. And, and it's kind of evidenced by the way God pronounced judgment on Adam. In verse 17 of chapter 3 of Genesis, God says, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground will be cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Does that resonate with anyone? <laughs> that it feels like all of your life you're just scratching, you're just, you're just trying to get ahead. And, and here's, here's the issue with this. God said, go out, create, make, make, make a world that reflects the beauty that I have given you. But then now humanity is filled with people who have their own agendas, who have their own concept of what that looks like. And in this verse, I really believe politics was born. Humanity decided, I'm going to start pursuing this as a way of creating what I think is right. And if you read the rest of Genesis, at least through chapter 11, with that in mind, you see what happens when humanity says, I'm going to do it my way. It's just, it's one story after the next of pain and suffering and, and issues. And so, like, you know, it's this whole concept that as we try to produce these things, you know, the earth is going to grow thorns and thistles, but you will eat from its produce. That you're going to go out, you're going to try to create beauty, you're going to try to create something wonderful that reflects me, but there's, there's going to be problems. And that's where we find ourselves. We, in our country, we, we have an amazing country but there's different people with different agendas and there's thorns and there's thistles. We're benefiting from its produce, but there's still, there's still issues. And so with the time we have left today, I want to talk about our politics. How do we navigate being Christians in a world that, that is chaotic and where everyone has competing visions of what it means to be a Christian in America? I want to take us back to Jeremiah and what God told the people who were heading into exile. In, in verses 5 and 6, he said, build homes, plan to stay, plant gardens. In other words, you're being sent somewhere and it's not going to be the place you want to be, but make the best of it. Here, here's what I understand. Whatever happens in the White House, whoever sits in the Oval Office has limited influence on what happens to me in my home. I'm not saying it doesn't have influence. Obviously, it does. But what I have seen is oftentimes, if we take care of what's happening in our house, if we take care of what's happening in our community, we can make a difference where we're at. And so while I totally agree we need to care about what's happening in national elections, I believe that a lot. But I also think our first priority is saying, what do we need to do in our own backyard? How do we need to build our families in such a way that it doesn't matter what happens around? Because remember, these people were being sent to a pagan nation that absolutely hated the things of God, taught things that were contrary to what the Israelites believed. They, they had systems of education that were meant to beat people down and indoctrinate them in the truths of the people of Babylon. And basically, Jeremiah is voicing the heart of God and saying, you can't necessarily control all of that. But you can control what's happening in your own house. You can control what you're teaching your children. You can control the attitude and the posture you take with your neighbors. 
So do it in a way that provides for flourishing. I mean, I find it interesting right there in the middle is that, that command that he gave back to Adam and Eve and he gave to, to Noah, multiply. Go into that place and multiply. Fill the land of Babylon with people who carry my image. Fill this place with people who follow God and understand his ways. You know, I, I honestly think one of the reasons that the Magi came to visit Jesus is because a young man named Daniel took seriously this command. And he rose to authority, and it says he began to teach the wise men of Babylon. And when we talk about visitors from the east on Christmas, we're probably talking about people who came from Babylon. I mean, it's crazy. When we actually put the effort into living out our lives in a way that our neighbors see the goodness of God living through us, we have no idea how generations that can be used to bless the church, that can be used to bless the people of God. He goes on to say, work for the peace and prosperity of the city where you live. Again, not that he's not saying, don't forget about the country, you know, but, but he's saying, wherever you live, work for peace and prosperity there. Try to find ways to continue to be a light for me wherever you find yourself. Because he says, the welfare of that city will determine your own welfare. How you care about what's happening in your own community is going to affect how well things go for you. And so this is, this is what we're called to. This is how we are to live this out in a local level. That we ought to be praying for our mayor. We ought to be praying for our city councils. We ought to be praying for our school boards. You know, there, there's a couple of pastors and I were getting together just this Thursday, and we were thinking, like, what if, what if we just assigned pastors that we're not going to protest, we're not going to hold up signs, we're not going to do anything, but we make sure there's a pastor at every city council meeting, there's a pastor at every school board meeting, just to go there and pray. To do nothing else but to pray over the decisions that are being made, not to sit there and record, not to sit there and try to get those gotcha moments, not to try to make you know some YouTube uh, sensation of you getting up and yelling at the people, but just going there and praying. What kind of difference would that make if our leaders saw our pastors in our community? praying for them, even if they don't realize what it is. Maybe just making them uncomfortable. We're just sitting there staring at them, smiling. I don't know. (laughs) But, but, But I think this is important. And it doesn't have to just be the pastors. You know, we, we can be people who take this seriously and pray and work for the peace and prosperity of our city, of our county, of our state. And we have to be careful. We're not getting caught up in the lies that are being propagated by people who say they're talking for God. You know, I find it interesting. And again, I'm not, I'm not here to put people on sides. I'm not here, we're not going to like, okay, if you're Republican, sit on this side. If you're Democrat, sit on that side. We're not going to do that this morning. But I do want to at least acknowledge that leading up to the last election, there were prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet who said Donald Trump would win the presidency in 2020. And prophet after prophet after prophet had to come and say, I was wrong. And I'm not, I'm not here to say you know, anything about that other than there's a lot of people who want to use the church for political aim. They, they, want, they, they want to come in and say, well, I'm a good Christian person, so this is why you need to vote for me. Don't follow after people. Don't follow after YouTube channels. Don't follow after your cable news choice 
and say, this is what Christianity is. And this, if you're a real Christian, you would vote this way because I saw it on this channel and this is what they said. What, what would happen if we just said, I'm going to follow the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, lead me. Teach me who I'm supposed to be praying for. Teach me who I'm supposed to be voting for. Help me to see beyond the myriad lies and actually trusting that the Holy Spirit is going to lead his people to vote the way they're supposed to vote. How crazy would our country look if that were to happen? Just, just a thought. And then there's just this little phrase there in verse 10 that kind of struck me. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. For most of us, that's what it will be like, right? There, there's people who call America the great Babylon. There, there's people who make the analogies between what's happening in America and what happened in Babylon. You, you, can, you can go down that rabbit hole as far as you want to go. But here's what I do know. You will be in the political sphere, you paying attention to what's happening in our country, probably about 70 years. And unless you're like one of those people who says, if that person gets in, I'm moving to Canada or something. Well, maybe, maybe not Canada. I don't know. You, you make your own decisions on where you're going to move when certain people come into office. But, but most likely, most of us will live in this country for 70 years. If we remain faithful, if we remain steadfast, there will be a time where we will enter into a different kingdom ruled by a different authority. And he promises here all the good things that he has promised he will fulfill. You know, one of the most quoted, most crocheted, most you know, put up on walls verses in all of the Bible is Jeremiah 29.11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. How many of you realized this was a political statement? How many of you realized God was saying, you're going to go through some awful times. You're going to live in a country not of your own making. But, I know the plans I have. You're going to be able to get through it. It doesn't matter who's sitting on the throne. It doesn't matter who's sitting in the White House. You will make it through because I have good plans for you. I want to challenge us to be a people who recognize we don't build our lives, we don't build our homes on the political sands. We build this on Jesus. Jesus gave us this promise in Matthew chapter 7. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of, am I a son of a prophet? I can't remember. Okay, maybe I am a son of a prophet. But, um, but, but this is what I know. I, I can't tell you who's going to get into the White House in a few days. I don't know. But I know this. The people who build their lives on Jesus will withstand whatever comes their way. It won't, it won't matter who's in the White House if we will keep our eyes on Jesus. If we will keep our focus on who he is and what he's called us to do. And if we will make the determination that we will listen to him and take seriously the call to work for the peace and prosperity of where we live now. Of the things we're walking through in these moments. That, that we look around this room and we see who can we bless? Who can we be a part of helping them draw closer to Jesus? How can we get outside of these walls and touch people? How can we partner with amazing missionaries and, and reach people on the other side of the world who have yet to hear? What is our place in all of this? 
if we will continue to ask those questions, I'm sure in 30 days from now, we're going to be okay. I'm, sh- I'm sure in four years from now, we're going to be just fine. Sure, we might have a few more things to complain about. That's okay. It just means we need to be prayerful. I, we had a time of prayer earlier this summer as we were looking towards the election. And I shared with people a um, thought that someone once gave to me. You should only complain about someone twice as much as you pray for them. Probably means a lot of us have a lot of praying to do for President Biden. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. You know, we, it's, it's okay to complain. Sort of. <laughs> Doesn't do a lot of good maybe, but here's the truth. I know prayer changes everything. And if we are a people who are dedicated to that, we're going to see some amazing things happen. So one, one thought to leave you with. Build on Jesus and you will stand the political storms. Build on him and you will be able to get through whatever comes next. I, I'm trying to de-escalate the fear. I'm trying to give you permission not to buy in to the chaos narrative that the news cycles are trying to hook you in with. Let's find our peace in Jesus. Let's build our lives on him. Let's say he is the one that we will trust and that we will support each other no matter who gets into office. So I got three acts of patriotism I'd like to ask you to do as we get ready to end our service today. Number one, pray. I think one of the most patriotic things you could do is pray. Our country was founded on prayer. It was founded by men and women who believed we needed to be a a people who could pray openly, who could trust in God and believe for great things. And so I want to encourage you to pray. I don't know if you uh, were paying attention to the prayer that was prayed at the beginning uh, of my message, but I went ahead and printed it out for you. If you didn't get one of these when you walked in, grab one um, on your way out. There's some more on the uh, table over there. But I want to challenge you, along with praying for me and Pastor Mark, (laughs) which I didn't know was coming, I want to challenge you, what if every one of us prayed this prayer for our country every day for the next 30 days? I don't know that it's going to get our candidate into the White House. I don't even know if we have the same candidate. Uh, but I do. <laughs> thank, thank you, Douglas. All right. So, <laughs> but, but I do know this. It's going to put our heart in a different place. If daily we simply say, Dear God, today we pray for America, a nation in desperate need of Jesus. Remind us that true freedom is found in the arms of our Savior. Lead us back to our first love, that we may be one nation under God. I think that puts our heart in the right place going into any day. And so I want to challenge you to do that. The other thing I want to challenge you to do is serve. Find some way to serve the people around you. We're supposed to be working for the peace and prosperity of our city. As a church, we have strived to do that over and over again. If we put up things that we're going to do to bless our community, find ways to get connected with it. If you don't like the things we're doing, great. I've got five, six, seven other churches that I partner with and I can help you find something you can connect with or there's any number of civic organizations that you could go and volunteer so that our community sees people who love Jesus also serve their community. And then lastly, I just want to 
encourage you to vote. I'm, I'm not going to do it today. Uh, maybe later in the series, kind of tongue-in-cheek, I may tell you who you should vote for. Uh, but this is what I do know. A third of Americans who were registered to vote last uh, uh, four years ago didn't. I, I tried to find this because I do, I, I listen to the political stuff too. I couldn't get this uh, verified, so I'm not going to say the exact statistic, but there was a lot of different people who were claiming that a majority of evangelical Christians aren't even registered to vote. If that's true, and if the church decided to say, we're going to stand up for the things we believe in, would there really even be an election? I mean, I, I believe that if the church got serious and we all asked the Holy Spirit, who are we supposed to be getting behind? How are we supposed, and what, what would it look differently? We live in a unique time. Israelites did not get to vote on who their next king was going to be. As a matter of fact, the arch of history bends towards tyranny. Most of human civilization has never known the privileges we have as a voting people. Take it seriously. If you're not registered to vote, get registered to vote. If you don't know who you should vote for, there's plenty of websites that can help you see how your viewpoint on the world, your, your Christian lens can lead you to voting for the people that honor the things that you feel honor God. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit next week, but just make the dedication. You're going to vote this year. If you didn't last year, if you couldn't last year, just do it. I, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not going to do a poll. I'm not going to ask you who you voted for. I'm not going to reprimand you if you didn't vote for the person I thought you were supposed to vote for. That's, that's not the purpose of our church. We want to build up Jesus. We want to build on him. We want to be under the authority of God. And we're going to trust he is going to lead us wherever that goes. So with that, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing one more song of worship. Acknowledging the fact that we need Jesus in this time. I also want to acknowledge the fact that God's been doing awesome things in our church. God has been speaking to people's spiritual needs. He's been healing people's physical needs. And so, in just a moment, after I'm done praying and as we're singing, there's going to be um, some people over here in this corner. If you need prayer for anything, please come seek out one of these people and let them pray for you. Maybe you just want to go pray by yourself. We have the prayer room over there set up. If you just want to sit and pray and, and seek God, you can take some time to do that. You, you, can put, you can put this prayer card into practice right now. You can, you can go in there or you can pray from your seat. Make sure as we leave that you connect with Wendy and her card and maybe you know, tuck their prayer card alongside this card uh, so that you can be remembered to pray for them too. But let, let's be a people who take seriously the call of God to work for the peace and prosperity of where we're living. Let, let me pray for us and then I'll release the worship team to lead us in this last song. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you've given us something solid to build on. God, please forgive us for the ways we have made idols out of political parties, out of news organizations, out of things that we have put and lifted up as more important than the kingdom. God, I thank you for people who have a desire to want to change the world, change their nation, change their community. But I pray that more of us would desire that through the leading of the Holy Spirit that we would be listening to your voice and acting in a way that honors you. 
that we would work for peace. That we would find ways of honoring you. And like Daniel and and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, that when the time comes and we have to stand up against tyranny, we'll we'll take our stands. We, We will speak against the evils in a way that will hopefully change hearts, but we'll do it out of a posture of love and reverence and humility before our God. God, I just pray that you would you would speak to people right now. You would help them to recognize the things you're calling them to do, the things that they can do in their own homes to provide peace and stability to their families, to this church, to our community. Continue to show us what it is to be a people in love with you, living in a world that needs to see it. God, if there's anyone here either in this room or joining us online and they don't know you, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would draw them to yourself. Help us to honor you. And that as we lift you up, people would come to know you. If if that's you, if you recognize you don't know Christ, you you need him in your life. You need Jesus. Could you just pray a simple prayer right now? Say something like, Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you died for me. And I believe that God rose you from the dead. Forgive me for my sins. Today I turn away from them and I turn to follow you. Holy Spirit, fill me so that I can follow Jesus every day of my life. God, I thank you for this new life as I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So again, if you need prayer for anything, maybe you prayed that prayer for the first time, please come see one of